Hi everyone, welcome to this week's Autonomy Talks. Uh, this week is a pleasure to have James Arizon, uh, who is a PhD candidate at the Autonomous Systems Lab uh, at Stanford University, working with uh, Marco Pavone. So something about James. James received a master's degree from Stanford University in 2018 and a bachelor's degree from McGill University in 2015, both in mechanical engineering. And his research uh, interests include uh, few shopped, adaptive and open world learning with application to robotic systems and uh, learning based control and enforcement learning. We are very happy about his talk today and uh, I'm very, interesting, very interested in what he's going to talk about. So without further ado, the stage is yours. Great. Thanks very much. Um, I hope you'll all forgive my maybe obvious uh, choice of intro song, but we just had a big landing on Mars. So I thought I would uh, celebrate accordingly. So my talk today is going to broadly address a class of, um, here I say Bayesian models in my title, but it's really Bayesian few shot learning models. I'll explain what that means. Um, and then applications to um, how we can learn in a way that's adaptive, kind of in the sense of adaptive control of in a non-anticipative, reactive, corrective way, uh, as well as um, how these merge with control systems. Okay, so let's consider a few motivating scenarios for why we may um, want this, this adaptive learning in the next 10 to 20 years uh, in an autonomy context, or, or what we can hope to accomplish by imbuing robots with autonomy in the next 10 to 20 years. Um, and so on the left, you see uh, a Mars rover system. So uh, this is actually curiosity, not perseverance, but Mars rover nonetheless. And on the right, you see um, some industrial manufacturing systems. So on the left, um, perseverance is actually slightly better than curiosity at this, but curiosity, uh, all of the movements were very closely and carefully planned. Um, so basically they would rehearse uh, both in simulation and with physical uh, copies of the rover on earth, uh, actions that they would take on Mars. And if there were any sort of risk sensitive scenarios uh, or, or scenarios in which the rover risk getting stuck, since this is how Spirit died, uh, they had these, these um, sandbox test beds that they would sort of really practice uh, risky maneuvers on. Um, and so Perseverance can, can go a, a couple hundred meters at, at most uh, autonomously, or so it's a sort of semi-autonomous semi operational scheme. Um, but I think the grand goal of, of Martian robotic exploration is that we ideally can send these craft down, specify scientific objectives, and have them basically autonomously explore, react to dangerous scenarios, identify possible terrain risks, especially in terms of um, sand entrapment, uh, and generally sort of autonomously search around and, and grab all the science and we can check back later. That's the dream, at least. Um, in the right-hand scenario, on the bottom left, you see Oh, sorry, the bottom right, you see really the standard application of robotic systems in uh, manufacturing. So these are giant, massively overbuilt robots uh, operating in a very large scale manufacturing environment. But what we would really like to get to, to if anything, make robotic systems more equitable is development of, of smaller scale, more flexible robot manufacturing systems that can take advantages of autonomy, autonomies of scale while being extremely flexible in terms of application. Um, so this is actually the goal of Rethink Robotics, which wasn't ultimately successful, but I think as a, a future, in especially focusing on achieving autonomies of scale with these highly flexible robots, it's a good goal. And it also will require substantial degrees of autonomy, just in terms of, of rapidly adapting to tasks and generally few shot learning. You need to be able to demonstrate something to a robot a very small number of times and have it be able to execute that task going forward. This is central to the flexibility of this robot system. So let's look at a recipe for how we could build a practical autonomy stack in the next sort of 10 to 20 years. Um, first, we need to identify novel scenarios, and this should be somewhat clear. Um, you, you know, if you're a chess grandmaster, the absolute first step in terms of, of you know, maybe beating the grand champion is identifying when the game has started. Um, we need to understand uh, the relevant parts of the system to access all the tasks. Again, this is not particularly surprising. Um, their what we call a state and maybe control theory it doesn't really mesh with sort of the high dimensional observations that we have of the real world. Um, and so we need to be able to extract how the relevant components of state evolve through time in a way that's perhaps not obvious. And then we need to, of course, choose actions to complete the task. And this is the goal of, of control theory or reinforcement learning or you know all of sequential decision making. Uh, and we need to ensure 
safety and satisfying our task objectives. So in terms of what this corresponds to in terms of technical ideas, uh, identifying novel scenarios involves uh, change point detection and concepts like open world learning, uh, which I'll explain later. Um, understanding some of these uh, system dynamics requires uh, few shot learning uh, and incorporating this with, with more standard approaches to system modeling. And then of course we need uh, safe learning and active learning to, to disambiguate uh, uncertain systems. So in terms of our outline of this talk, uh, I'm gonna talk about deep models that are capable of efficient online adaptation. So this is a uh, few shot learning, metal learning, open world learning, stuff like that. Uh, Bayesian metal learning models, as I said, and how to integrate them with sort of uh, nominal system models in the context of robotics. And then methods for efficient control with these learned models. So I'm gonna be uh, not just sort of presenting totally separate control ideas, uh, but really a control strategy that is, is tuned to the class of few shot learners that we build. Um, so this is a rough outline for my talk. So it's going to be roughly split into two parts. Uh, the first part is going to be uh, pretty much entirely the few shot meta learning, uh, open world learning, etc. So um, I'll, I'll stop sort of at the first half and take any questions on the learning part, and then the second part will will be uh, robotics applications. Okay, so we're first going to talk about conjugate models for uh, Bayesian adaptive and meta learning. So in standard deep learning or machine learning, your pipeline kind of looks like this. You're given a data set with X, Y pairs. Um, X is from some density, which in regression tasks, you typically don't try to characterize. And then you have some conditional density Y. You want to learn some model, uh, G sub theta, where theta is your model parameters, um, that can predict Y and minimizes some loss function, uh, not L. L. So this is under, not super surprising. Uh, this is you know usually done by like empirical risk minimization or, or whatever other uh, machine learning intellectual framework you, you specify. <clears throat> in meta learning, I said, instead of reasoning of one data set of, of data sampled from some generative model, we instead reason of a metadata set of data sets where each data set corresponds to one task. So what you can think of is a collection of generative processes that are related in, in some sense. Um, and we have the data from each of those generative processes. So here I, spent, I write task uh, with a math T, uh, and then we have data generation for where our X's and Y's that are um, uh, task dependent. So our goal is to minimize um, our predictive error by specifying some loss that takes both our input X as previously, uh, but that's actually insufficient for doing well on our task because we need to also at some level identify what task we're operating in. So we're not only taking our uh, input X, but we're also taking the previous data that we've seen in this task in a way to implicitly infer what task it is, uh, even if we haven't built up a whole assumed generative model around that task. So a predictive model that takes a small amount of context data and maps that into a prediction, and we want to minimize this loss uh, over data drawn from a task and then over some distribution of tasks. Okay. So just in terms of graphical models, uh, and I've changed notation here a little bit. So sorry, that's a little confusing. It's kind of necessary as we get into the more Bayesian methods where uh, the generative model and, and your uh, computational model kind of get interlinked. Uh, so in supervised learning, we have some XY pairs with some parameters theta that are sort of across those uh, pairs of data. Uh, and we want to infer, infer those data. And then where we go in meta learning is we have some parameter C that are across tasks where we have M tasks and then we have a theta for each task. Okay. So if we want to mathematically formalize our approach to the meta learning problem, there's a couple of approaches that we can take. So the first that we'll talk about is a bi-level optimization approach. Um, and so consider empirical risk minimization. It typically looks like this. We have some loss function where with some abusive notation, I've now rewritten my loss just as a function of the parameters of my model. So I fixed a hypothesis class and now I just have some parameters. Uh, my loss uh, is dependent on those. And we want to choose some set of best parameters that uh, minimize this loss function. Okay, so, so this is unsurprising. This is kind of what you find your first course on machine learning uh, thinking about. In optimization-based meta learning, we have this operating at the upper level. Um, so can you guys oh, can you guys see my cursor? Okay, great. Um, so we have some C uh, 
that uh, we want to minimize our predictive loss on some test set for each task. Um, but the problem is that is based on uh, some inferred set of parameters within each task um, that is itself a consequence of a minimization problem or an optimization problem. So uh, rephrasing this, we have, our, our goal is to infer a set of task dependent parameters theta uh, that minimizes our loss function on some train set. And then those are used in an outer loop uh, to, to choose our best estimate of our parameters C star. Um, and so this is difficult because this bi-level optimization problem involves basically to get a gradient for the upper optimization problem, you have to uh, differentiate your lower level optimization problem, uh, which is sort of outside of the standard computational toolbox. Um, a lens that we will take more in this talk is mental learning as empirical Bayes. Um, so in Bayesian inference, we typically have some model. Um, so we, we have some, uh, th this is our, our predictive density. So we have some Y star, X star, uh, as well as some, some Y and X that we've seen. So this is sort of data that we've seen. Uh, we have a test input. We want to predict the, the posterior predictive over a test, uh, a test label. And then we have some hyperparameters to see. And the way that we compute this predictive distribution is by marginalizing over our parameters. So we specify, uh, or we have a posterior over our parameters, and then we marginalize or do Bayesian averaging over those parameters uh, to compute our predictive. And this posterior predictive, or sorry, this posterior distribution over theta is coming from Bayes rules. So this is at the heart of Bayesian inference. Uh, instead of constructing an estimator for theta uh, that yields a point estimate, we are using Bayes rule, we're specifying a prior on theta. We are looking at uh, the likelihood uh, under our assumed model. And then we are uh, just using Bayes rule to compute our posterior with theta. So I'm moving a little fast through uh, you know, several courses on statistics. So I'm happy to loop back on this. Uh, I'll, I'll make this all much more concrete in a moment. But basically the idea is that we are gonna use Bayes rule, compute a distribution over theta and then average over theta. Um, this is basically tractable for a very large class of models, but for a few models, uh, it, it retains analytical tractability. And I'll discuss that more later. The key to empirical Bayes is that if we were very principled Bayesians, we would specify priors on all of our parameters in our model, uh, look at our posterior for all of them, and then average over all of them. But in practice, you have sort of declining importance as you sort of work up your uh, graph of hyperparameters in terms of how much averaging uh, really matters. And also it's computationally extremely difficult. So what empirical Bayes does is we want to average, it, it's sort of a, a, a Bayesian frequentist hybrid method in that we want to average over our uh, sort of lower level parameters and then compute point estimates of our higher level parameters. So we're going to approximate our, our predictive distribution um, by computing a point estimate for our hyperparameters C uh, just using uh, standard maximum likelihood. Okay. So again, I've moved pretty fast through this. I'm going to make it uh, quite a bit more, more concrete in the immediate future. So as I said, mostly Bayesian inference methods are computationally intractable, and we typically turn to um, sampling methods to, to sample from our posterior distribution. Um, there's a small number of conjugate models for which po posterior inference can be performed exactly. Um, so there's a few examples that you're probably all familiar with. Um, so the mathematics of the Kalman filter is one example, uh, Gaussian process models, uh, typically Gaussian Gaussian models where your prior and your uh, likelihood are Gaussian uh, are the sort of the, the most common uh, analytically tractable Bayesian model. And that's what we're gonna be exploiting here. So the core idea of the meta learning models that I'm going to present in this section are, we want models that are capable of um, averaging over their uncertainty in the small data regime. So what we're gonna do is we're going to use analytically tractable Bayesian inference uh, on learned features in our inner loop. So we, when we're in some task and we have just a small amount of data, we're going to do this analytical Bayesian inference. And then in the outer loop, which corresponds to the sort of empirical Bayes process, um, we're going to just compute point estimates of, of our, our feature weights in, in a neural network model, for example. So let's make this more concrete. Uh, the first model that I'll present uh, is something we call alpaca. And the model is basically a standard neural network model. So we have some label Y that's a function of basically taking X, mapping it through a neural network encoder, uh, 
and then multiplying that neural network encoder by some last layer, so output layer. So K is just a matrix. And then epsilon is uh, is a uh, zero mean Gaussian error term. So we'll specify a Gaussian prior on K. And this, because we have a Gaussian additive noise, this yields uh, a Gaussian posterior and a Gaussian posterior predictive. So all of the, uh, the entire Bayesian inference process is analytically tractable and differentiable. Uh, yep. And so to train this, we will sample some contact data, compute our posterior over K, and then compute our posterior predictive, and then use that posterior predictive to uh, basically compute or perform max likelihood to compute the weights of the neural network. So fundamentally what we're doing is we are uh, doing Bayesian inference on the last layer of the neural network, computing our posterior predictive distribution, using that to get a likelihood, and then back propagating our errors or our, our predictive error or predictive loss uh, through the Bayesian inference process to train the neural network as well as the priors uh, on our last layer K. Okay. Uh, so let's look at how this works just on a simple sinusoid example for now. Uh, in the left column here, we can see Gaussian process regression. Uh, so this is just standard squared exponential kernel that most of you are probably familiar with. Um, and, and it sort of has the behavior that we would expect. Um, you know, the covariance is basically squeezed around uh, measurements on, on this function. In the alpaca model in the middle, this, uh, this model has been trained on a variety of sinusoids with different phases and amplitudes, and has learned to basically very rapidly infer, infer sinusoids. So given only a couple measurements, it can quite efficiently infer the sinusoid uh, almost perfectly. Uh, and then on the right-hand side, you can see an alpaca model that has been trained without this metal learning process. And while we find that the prior looks quite good, the uh, posterior is, is miscalibrated. Um, we ran alpaca on a variety of other problems. So dynamical systems modeling, um, here I show a, a hopper model and a, uh, a pendulum model, and we find it outperforms. Uh, Gaussian process regression for sure, as well as other competing uh, meta learning algorithms like MAML, uh, which is a very popular um, optimization based meta learning algorithm. And then it can model sort of non smooth functions as well, like the step function on the left. Uh, so before I move on, because I've covered maybe a lot of mathematical foundations, uh, I'm happy to take any questions here. Uh, and if there are no questions, then I can keep going. Yeah, okay. if somebody has a question, just unmute yourself. Doesn't seem so. Okay, all right, I'll keep going for now. So the alpaca model gives us a, a way to do um, regression, but we'd also like to do classification, especially in um, in image recognition uh, setting. So as a bit of a primer, in perhaps a, a first class on, on machine learning, uh, you would see discriminative models and generative models. And discriminative models model just the boundary between two data sets, for example, um, whereas um, generative models fit a density to each of these uh, and then from that extract a decision threshold. So sort of the first uh, generative model you see is Gaussian discriminant analysis. So what you would do in this is you look at your data, you assume it's generated from a Gaussian, you fit a Gaussian to each data set, in, in your feature space. Um, given this mean and variance, you can define your uh, decision threshold or your decision boundary exactly for each class. And then that allows you to make decisions going forward. In the Bayesian form of uh, GDA, you uh, will assume that your data is generated uh, labels according to some categorical distribution. And then the mean or, or a measurement for uh, in feature space for a given class uh, is generated by some, some Gaussian. Uh, you can place some Dirichlet priors on your class probabilities and then Gaussian priors on your, um, on your means. And this choice of prior, again, through conjugacy yields analytically computable posteriors. Um, so, so the entire uh, posterior computation process, again, remains differentiable. So our approach, uh, PCOC, which stands for uh, probabilistic uh, clustering for online classification, um, is a doing a very similar thing to the alpaca model in that uh, we're going to backprop through the GDA process to learn neural network features. So basically we are taking input data, we are mapping it through some encoder network that maps to some feature space. Uh, 
in that feature space, we are doing Bayesian GDA. And then backcropping through that process, we train the neural network model. And this generalizes several uh, so-called metric-based meta-learning algorithms. Um, and it pairs naturally with a, a regularized embedding pre-training, which I'll discuss more uh, in a moment. So what we would like to be able to do in classification especially is not just uh, identify in, in a few shot way um, sort of arbitrarily specified classes. So, so the standard sort of meta learning setting for, for image classification is you have sort of, you know, you have five classes and you have uh, maybe one data point for each of those classes. And then you have to predict well given new classes. And this is pretty artificial. And I think where we actually want to go with classification systems in a few shot uh, setting is an open world setting in which we have an unknown universe of classes. We need to be able to detect novel classes at runtime. And this is extremely critical. Um, and we need to uh, learn novel classes given a small amount of data without uh, a substantial amount of retraining. So if you have a, an autonomous car driving around, it needs to definitely be able to detect novel classes at runtime. Um, this is safety critical. And then ideally, we want to be able to learn the these novel classes with a small amount of data. And this is more a desiderata. It's, it's less critical, but it, it, it would be nice. Uh, an example of this is, is I'm Canadian. Uh, this is not a totally uncommon site in some parts of the country. Uh, and if you are building your self-driving cars in California, I can assure you that there are no moose down here. So we, we would like to be able to uh, identify and react and at least characterize our own uncertainty as to what we're seeing. So our approach in this setting is lifelong peacock. And this is a relatively simple augmentation of the peacock model that I've described so far. And it's really, we're replacing our Dirichlet prior uh, over classes with a Dirichlet process, which allows for a potentially unbounded number of classes. And in particular, we'll specify a Chinese restaurant process uh, prior, which basically, um, is similar to a Dirichlet process, it basically has a regularized count-based posteriors. So your probability uh, of some observed class is basically dependent on the number of data points that you've seen for that class. Uh, but then you also have a probability for a new class uh, based on the number of data points total you've seen so far, as well as some parameters that, that you'll learn. So this allows us to specify a prior over seeing a new class. And then once we have uh, seen this new class, we can sort of instantiate a new class bucket. And then uh, we now have K plus one classes and we uh, continue on. Um, this is a sort of semi-tangential point, but in few shot classification, there's been a lot of work on what the importance of pre-training is, because uh, it seems that we get a lot more signal from just standard uh, classified, uh, standard supervised pre-training uh, and combining this with meta-learning. So our formulation of Peacock allows us to, uh, basically the GDA clustering in feature space of Peacock allows us to do a natural form of pre-training in which we also replace a standard classifier um, with a uh, cluster-based or embedding-based classifier. So instead of uh, a standard classification network is mapping through some feature space uh, and then applying a softmax transformation on some computed uh, logits and, uh, and outputting the probabilities from that softmax. And this corresponds to linear decision regions in feature space. What we wanna do instead is assume that we have Gaussian clusters in feature space, which obviously closely matches uh, our peacock approach uh, and do classification based on this. And so just sort of moving very quickly through <laughs> these results, uh, we find that this embedding based pre training really substantially improves the performance of uh, few shot learning themes. So this is a bridge between sort of the few shot learning regime and the general supervised regime. Uh, and we find that training this, this lifelong peacock approach in the way that we train it uh, results in substantially better um, out of distribution characterization or, or detection of, of novel classes. Uh, so basically uh, the total predictive accuracy is reflected by uh, the total accuracy figure here. And we see that we're, we're reasonably competitive with uh, a class of models that are also trained with this supervised embedding pre-training. But this doesn't reflect the fact that it's safety critical to detect an, a novel class when it occurs. And this is reflected by our OROC measure or area under the ROC curve, uh, 
Um, and we find that our, our lifelong peacock approach uh, yields substantially better novel class detection. Uh, again, tiered image net is similar. On the right, we have uh, the ROC curve for uh, basically a standard proto net, which is a, a standard uh, meta learning classification algorithm, uh, as well as our LP clock method. So I'll move fast these because they aren't too, too critical. But um, basically, we've extended the, the peacock method to the, the open world setting, um, and it seems to perform fairly well. OK, so we've so far talked about a static notion of task. So, so in our meta learning setup, we assumed that um, that we were encountering tasks episodically, and we knew that they were fixed for the duration of that task. In a lot of robotic autonomy problems, I think this is kind of obviously a, a poor assumption, especially if you are operating in sort of an unstructured world. Um, so if you imagine back to the Mars rover example, um, there's no obvious notion of task that you have clear segmentation as to when it may or may not change. So we can start to augment this model with, um, with dynamical models for how the task evolves in time. And this uh, generalizes to uh, sort of general non-stationary dynamics or, or filtering models. And the simplest approach is basically just common filtering, which I, I assume most of you are familiar with. So we'll basically ascribe linear dynamics to our uh, alpaca parameters. So I've, I've sort of transposed it here in that uh, previously I had uh, a matrix K that was being inferred and then a, a vector of neural network features phi. I've sort of switched this. So now I have a matrix of neural network features, capital phi, and then a vector of parameters. And those vector of parameters obey linear dynamics. Um, and so this could uh, represent a, a variety of relatively simple processes. Uh, so this Kalman filter output layer induces quite a strong inductive bias relative to um, standard sequence modeling approaches like RNNs. Um, and in particular, these, these Kalman filter output layers generalize a huge number of uh, classical forecasting models, such as um, exponential smoothing, autoregressive moving average models, seasonality models, et cetera. You can basically express all of these models through the language of, of Kalman filtering uh, on some set of features. And the thing that's nice is that although I said this has a strong inductive bias relative to standard time series architectures, it can be combined with standard time series architectures as well. So if you have sort of structured prediction that you think, uh, you know, maybe an RNN is well suited to, uh, you can combine this with an RNN and just have the, the Kalman filter on the last layer as a more reactive uh, adaptation method. So RNN, LSTM, GRU, you can combine it with any of these methods just because you're, you know, uh, inferring the last layer. And interestingly, the winner of the M4 competition, which is uh, basically the biggest forecasting competition, uh, was a whole winters model applied to the output of a stacked LSTM model. So a whole winters is basically an exponential smoothing model with seasonality. Uh, and so this combination of classical, classical forecasting techniques with modern deep learning architectures seems to be extremely effective. And I think will be a very fruitful area to explore going forward. And just some really basic results. Uh, again, in just like a simple sinusoid re regime, uh, these are two sinusoids that have different phase and amplitude dynamics. And then this is Kalman filtering uh, on the last side of the neural network, which is our prediction in blue. And we find that, you know, for differing dynamics for the, the sinusoid, we, we track it quite well. Okay. <clears throat> so we've so far talked about um, inference in a fixed task regime where we have different episodes. Uh, in which we know the task is fixed and sort of drifting task dynamics with uh, gradual variation. But if we're this Mars rover and we want to drive around from maybe uh, sand to rocks to back to sand, we need to be able to quite efficiently infer sort of sharp changes uh, in our underlying latent variables. Uh, even when we don't have the uh, clear task segmentation provided externally. Uh, so a learning system must be able to detect the change in task. Uh, and we would like to enable the use of these similar meta learning algorithms, even if we don't have these unsegmented, or even if we have these unsegmented tasks at train time. So our approach to this is called uh, meta learning with online change point analysis. So we build on Bayesian online change point detection, which is a, uh, as it sounds, Bayesian change point detection scheme. And the way this works is it basically specifies a universe of uh, different run lengths for a fixed model. So given, let's say, uh, a Kalman filter, uh, or maybe uh, let's specify just a, a 
uh, Bayesian linear regression model, you can say, okay, my task started uh, at this time step, so I should make predictions under my prior, or my task started um, one time step ago, two time steps ago, three time steps ago, et cetera. So each of these run lengths has an associated posterior uh, under which you would want to make predictions. And then what you're doing is you are applying hmm, standard Bayesian, uh, discrete Bayesian filtering to this universe of different run lengths. Uh, so what you're saying, what you're doing is you're predicting under one time step, two time steps, three time steps under the posteriors for each of those. Um, each of them will have different predictive accuracies and you are updating your belief as to what the run length or the duration that you've been in the current task is uh, by looking at the predictive ability of these Bayesian models. So the key insight of uh, MOCA, which is Meta Learning Without Online Change Point Analysis, is that this process of Bayesian filtering is differentiable and therefore we can train meta learning models on unsegmented uh, <clears throat> uh, sequential data by backpropagating uh, through this change point detection algorithm. So as I said, we maintain a belief over the run length as well as the statistics of the posterior for each run length. Uh, our output is a weighted mixture of the posterior predictive and it's weighted by our, uh, our belief for each run length. And we can apply this with any meta learning algorithm. So we're going to apply it with Alpaca and Peacock, as you would maybe expect, as well as uh, recurrent neural networks, which are sort of the simplest uh, meta learning algorithm. And on the right, you see this algorithm in a, again, switching sinusoid setting. Uh, on the bottom, you see the belief over uh, the run length. So on the x-axis, we have uh, time. And on the y-axis, we have the, the run length. And so the intensity of the cell uh, you know, the intensity of one of these cells corresponds to the degree of belief. So what these sort of triangles that you're seeing are with sort of uh, quite an intense belief in, in the, uh, escalating this triangle array that sort of points back to a point on the x-axis corresponds to a strong belief that uh, the, the task changed at that exact point and we're maintaining that belief through time. And so the red, the, the red lines indicate the true change points. And so you see that we basically uh, quite carefully or quite quite uh, effectively infer uh, the true change points and our predictive uh, performance is, is quite strong. In addition to these simple sinusoids, uh, we investigate uh, the performance of MOCA on a variety of different environments. Uh, so as, as I said, sinusoid as well as bandit problems, uh, as well as an NBA player movement data set, which you see visualized in the top right. So. This is quite interesting because this has perhaps not a natural segmentation. So it's interesting to see which segments are extracted by the, the model. And what we see is they correspond quite intuitively to what a human would, would label them as. So um, it, it, I forget what's happening exactly in this demonstration, but I think the player is sort of like getting a rebound and then running down court and then swinging around to the three-point line and then driving into the, to the net. Uh, and it, it sort of segments all of these sort of as you would expect. Uh, we also apply this to classification problems such as um, MNIST and, and mini ImageNet. Okay, so that wraps up the, the learning portion of this talk. I'm happy to take any questions on, on the learning work uh, before moving into some more robotics applications. Sounds like there are no questions. Feel free to, to jump in anytime if you, if you have any questions. Okay. <clears throat> so I've so far talked about how we can build few shot learning algorithms, but it's not completely obvious how we should be applying these to robotic systems. And I'm sort of a believer in uh, why reinvent the wheel. Uh, we shouldn't sort of entirely try to learn our robot dynamics from scratch, but the standard approach is maybe learn a residual model. So we have some prediction from our nominal physics model or whatever nominal model we have. And then we wanna learn an error term. And this I think is a little overly simple in that it misses possible incorporations between a learned model and, and an analytical model that could strengthen both. Um, so in particular, your analytical model uh, specifies some sort of computation graph and parts of that computation graph could be useful in your learned model. Um, so in this work, we, we investigate pairing our, our adaptive learned model with an adaptive nominal model as well. So in particular, uh, in, in this example, we consider rover dynamics. So if you're wondering whether, where the slight, uh, 
confusion came from with the rover motivation, but a bunch of like uh, learning examples. This is where we get back to rovers. Um, we specify a, a nominal physics model for the rover physics, uh, in particular, the interaction, the, the terra mechanics, basically, the interaction with, with uh, soil. Um, and we specify this nominal physics model that is linearly parameterized in terms of some unknown terrain parameters, uh, in particular, cohesion and angle of internal friction. We then combine this, uh, this nominal linearly parameterized model with an alpaca model, and we jointly infer both our nominal physics parameters as well as parameters corresponding to, uh, uh, to, to our black box learned model. Uh, so this basically corresponds to just stacking up our nominal features uh, and stacking up our, uh, our, our neural network features uh, and stacking up our, our model parameters as well. What's important is that in the, uh, when we're inferring parameters of our nominal physics model, these may be used for more than just uh, predictive accuracy. So it's not really sufficient for us to just combine our black box model with a nominal physics model and uh, say, okay, go ahead, predict whatever you want. You know, if I'm an engineer at NASA, I may be monitoring uh, the cohesion of, of the soil that we've inferred to see if it's safe for us to be operating there, if some intervention is required, or maybe there's some sort of scientific goal. So what we would like when we augment our nominal physics model with a learned black box model is to not, basically not disrupt the nominal physics model uh, too much. And so what we do is we imply, or we, we uh, add an interpretability uh, objective via a feature orthogonality regularizer. So basically we, we consider our stacked features of both our, our uh, physics features and our neural network features. And we attempt to enforce orthogonality uh, between these features, which minimizes collinearity between them. And thus the addition of our uh, black box model to our uh, physics model in the best case should not change the inferred parameters in the nominal physics model. So in some very simple simulated experiments in two different, uh, um, uh, different uh, sands, what we find is, uh, so this linear model is, um, uh, a, a, this is basically just our linear physics model on its own uh, without any sort of nonlinear correction term. And, and we find that uh, on the y-axis here, we have uh, predictive error. So we find it, it, it models actually fairly well, sort of as you would expect. Uh, it's, a, it's a fairly decent uh, physics model. Um, what we find that is that the alpaca model on its own typically predicts better, uh, so has lower predictive error um, and doesn't have the sort of constant bias that you would see. Combining the, the alpaca model with the linear model yields um, slight gains. Uh, so the predict predictive error is uh, slightly lower and um, it actually trains quite a bit faster and uses less data than a standard alpaca model just because you have a strong control variant basically. Interestingly, combining the alpaca model with the linear physics model uh, and enforcing feature orthogonality doesn't harm predictive power, it actually slightly improves predictive power, or at least uh, doesn't harm predictive power. And the effect of it is more visible uh, when we look at the, the inference of our, um, of our uh, nominal physics parameters. Uh, so this is our linear model, uh, which again has a sort of constant offset as well as a, a model that was published by uh, Yigmima et al. Uh, and this is sort of the standard in the literature. The alpaca model combined naively with the linear model yields basically incorrect parameter estimates due to collinearity. Uh, and this plot was basically the motivation for this part of the algorithm. Um, but when we induce feature orthogonality, we actually get better predictive performance uh, for our parameters than any of the model, uh, any of the other models. And this is sort of expressed succinctly in uh, this plot. Our linear model has high prediction error, but relatively low parameter error. Um, zero, so uh, red here uh, corresponds to no orthogonality regularization. Uh, it has quite high parameter estimation error, but low uh, predictive error. And then our models, as we interpolate through uh, different orthogonality regularization strengths, we find that it sort of sweeps out an ideal uh, range of, of performance. And what we actually see is that enforcing this orthogonality term uh, yields to both better 
dynamics prediction error, uh, as well as parameter estimation error, or, or less error in both of these axes. So we basically strictly gain from adding this uh, regularization. <clears throat> so in those experiments, we basically assumed that the terrain was fixed over time. And I presented a couple approaches for inferring changing terrain, but those assume that the terrain parameters evolve uh, in time. And we know that this is untrue. So as you are driving around on Mars, uh, if you're sort of always driving forward, this is approximately true. Uh, you, are, you are going to experience your terrain parameters evolving through time because you are evolving through space and also time is evolving. Uh, this is of course inaccurate. And this inaccuracy becomes clear if we ever return to the same terrain. Uh, so what we would like to do is instead of modeling our, uh, our parameters as, as temporally evolving, we want to model them explicitly as spatially varying so that we can return to the same area, use our previous knowledge, and perform better as a result. Um, <clears throat> so the model that we take for this approach is basically a generalization of an alpaca model where we have some nominal neural network features, uh, capital P, uh, or sorry, some, some neural network features, uh, capital P, and those are a function of are non-position state variables. So uh, velocities, uh, joint angles, stuff like that. And then instead of just a last layer that is temporally dependent, uh, you know, that, that evolves via, via common filtering or whatever, or that we infer through common filtering, we instead specify a spatially dependent Gaussian process or, or a vector of, of uh, spatially dependent Gaussian processes. So this corresponds to a, um, non-parametric or semi-parametric latent factor model um, is the, the fancy term for it. Uh, but basically inference in this model of, of this cap of this matrix capital P multiplying uh, the vector of GPSK um, is analytically tractable under the same, uh, basically you, you can derive it the same way as you would uh, your, your inference rules for a standard Gaussian process. So this specifies basically an alternative kernel for your Gaussian process. And what this model is really doing is it is saying, if you condition on your terrain parameters and sort of slide your rover over, nothing should change. And so, which is intuitive with how we understand, you know, the physics of terra mechanics. Um, and so we want to reflect this in our dynamics, this, this spatial invariance in terms of our, our dynamics, but we also need to do spatial mapping of our parameters. And so this model sort of splits this into Gaussian process for mapping the, the spatial parameters, uh, as well as uh, spatially invariant uh, neural network dynamics. And what we see is when we run this model over uh, the same terrain multiple times, so we have our, our rover sort of drive forward and then we stop and we pick it up and we move it back and we drop it back down and it drives over again. And we do this multiple times. Uh, you can see in the green curve, our first prediction is uh, not so great in, in terms of accuracy. It's not terrible, but it's not great. And in subsequent runs, we uh, basically monotonically improve our predictive uh, our predictive performance as a direct consequence of this spatial mapping. So these are preliminary results. Uh, we're running a more uh, extensive set of tests than this one plot right now, but we, we see that this model uh, shows early promise. Okay, uh, so to wrap up, I'll talk about applications uh, of these models within a, a control stack. So the goal is this, uh, we so far talked about system modeling and that's all great, but we need to use this, this model to to make some decisions about how we should move around in some environment. Uh, and we're gonna formalize this goal by saying, given some trained alpaca model, we want to navigate from some safe initial region to some safe goal region uh, while avoiding constraints or while, while avoiding collisions maybe. So this is expressed in a fairly natural way. We wanna minimize some cost. Uh, we're subject to some dynamics. H here is a nominal model. We're working with, uh, non-parameterized nominal models here. So, so the nominal model doesn't change in time, uh, but we have some, uh, some error term that has unknown parameters and we're gonna model that the, the G term here uh, with an alpaca model. And then we have some chance constraints. Uh, so the, basically the probabilistic nature of all this makes us uh, uh, specify our constraints as, as probabilistic constraints, so, so chance constraints. And we basically want to achieve probabilistic collision avoidance. So we don't want our uh, spacecraft to hit anything, obviously, uh, as well as control limits and uh, goal, our, our goal constraints as well. Okay, so our approach, which is called uh, SEALs, 
builds on the fact that basically we need to safely uh, explore and exploit within some environment. So we need to infer the parameters of our dynamical system so that we can perform better in this environment. Uh, but we also need to uh, exploit and sort of reach the goal uh, as we intended. And this is basically computationally tractable. The, the process of, of optimally trading off explore exploit is typically called uh, dual control and is broadly seen as not really uh, tractable. So instead we'll take a heuristic method where we're kind of gonna disregard our loss function and consider more strictly, or we're, we're gonna emphasize our, our, our terminal constraints. So if we can safely reach our goal region, and this may not be possible given our current understanding of the world, so we may have high uncertainty over our parameters, but if we can reach our goal region, then we should do it. Uh, and this is basically propagating our uncertainty of our uh, over our parameters forward to look at how it's reflected in our um, set of possible future states. But if we can safely reach a goal region, then we should do it. If we can't, then we'll ignore the goal for now and we will safely explore around our initial region to gather information until uh, exploitation is possible. So as I said, the explore phase, uh, we assume safe initial invariant set and policy. So we have some policy that keeps us in some initial safe set. And then we plan information gathering trajectories that return to that uh, initial set. So basically we'll do small little jumps around our, our initial set, sometimes leaving our safe initial set to explore uh, in some, some neighborhood. And this problem is always feasible due to the initial safe policy. So you can always plan a shorter and shorter uh, exploration trajectory. And the limit of that is a one-step exploration trajectory, which corresponds exactly to our, our policy. Or our policy is a one-step exploration strategy that satisfies our constraints. And then once we have explored enough, and we, as we project our uncertainty forward, it is small enough that we can reach our goal region, then we should exploit. So, so this may not be optimal because we're not uh, optimally trading off explore exploit, um, but we're, you, you know, usually our cost function is, is a little artificial anyway. So we'll propagate our uncertainty forward and then we'll execute a sequence of actions to take us to our goal region. And this is done in a mostly open loop way with some stabilizing uh, feedback, but there's no NPC or anything. Um, there's a variety of theoretical results that I'm not really going to get into. Um, they basically rely on constructing a initial confidence set that even under correlated uh, data collection still guarantees that we can uh, maintain a set uh, in which our parameters live with, with some high probability. And this is a direct consequence of the linear, uh, the linear regression process that we are doing. So we actually build on Gaussian process uh, bandit results. Uh, for to construct these confidence sets. Uh, we use Monte Carlo methods for forward reachability estimation. Um, this was a big part of the project. Uh, a lot of similar literature uses methods like Lipschitz propagation, which we found to be much too conservative for most real world problems. So we don't have a, any finite sample guarantees. Uh, we could construct them using um, concentration inequalities, but we found that those were also much too conservative. So we kind of uh, gave up on, on finite sample uh, guarantees, but uh, as your number of samples uh, goes to infinity, you'll have your exact reachability set and then you'll have your guarantees. So we have sort of asymptotic guarantees. Uh, and then we can guarantee uh, probabilistic safety and feasibility for all time. So in manipulator problems, uh, we have the simple three link manipulator here. And this is sort of showing two explorer phases and then the exploit phase. So what it's doing is it's, it's carrying an uncertain payload and it's kind of, uh, <laughs> its exploration behavior is kind of what you expect. It's kind of shaking around the, uh, the mass in place to infer the inertial parameters of it. And then once it has fairly high confidence over the uh, inferred inertial parameters of it, it is uh, sort of choosing a path through uh, these two obstacles uh, to reach the, the safe goal set shown in teal. Uh, it's a little easier to see in the free flyer case. So this is the free flyer test bed that exists in the ASL at Stanford. So these robots are kind of like reverse air hockey uh, pucks, I guess. So they contain CO2 tanks, they, they ride around on air bearings and we have very low friction. Uh, so we specify some goal regions. We see that uh, these spacecrafts, which are again, carrying an uncertain load, uh, which is reflective of maybe uh, a manipulation task that would occur on the ISS. Uh, so, so this robot sort of explores locally in some known safe region, uh, disambiguates the inertial parameters uh, 
and then uh, exploits by reaching the, the goal by propagating and searching forward to the goal region. Uh, so that's shown in this animation and as well as these, these images on the bottom right. Uh, in terms of quantitative results, um, I haven't talked about the regularization scheme we build, uh, which we call uh, beta regularization here. Um, basically, it arises from the, um, the, the set construction method that we, we use that I, I talked about previously, uh, the, the bandit result. Uh, basically, we can, we can regularize some terms that occur in that, uh, again, uh, sort of uh, tighter estimates uh, in terms of training our neural network. But what we see is that for um, a variety of specified safety levels, so delta is basically the uh, probability, one minus the probability of success, uh, we see that we uh, are always above that specified probability, but we are not always up at 99.9%, .9%, which is not what we want. Ideally, we wanna be as close to the specified probability of success as possible. So ideally we would be very close to this line, uh, but always above it. And this is because when we specify as a system designer, well, when we specify a degree of safety, uh, we want this to actually reflect what the system is going to do. If, our, if we specify any degree of safety and our system is always 99.9% .9 safe, well, then that's massively over conservative and we can't adequately characterize the set of environments or the set of, of uh, tasks that can be accomplished by this system. Um, on the right, we see for a variety of different um, uh, numbers of samples, uh, they sort of behave as you'd expect with fewer samples, we, we have less safety, uh, occasionally dipping into uh, slightly unsafe. Um, but, uh, but overall, we can always increase our number of samples to get better safety. Um, I, due to time, I'm gonna skip the rest of these last two slides. Uh, I'll thank my co-authors and I'm happy to take any questions. Thank you very much, James, for the great talk. Um, are there questions from the audience? Don't be shy. Okay. Um, If really nobody has questions, they can ask one. Um, so uh, you if you showed us four different phases of the work on different touching different points, um, and you you kind of said what what you want to do next. But uh, um, I would like to hear more about the next steps, really uh, following a vision. What what is the thing that excites you more about all these things you presented us? Sure. So. Um, there are improvements being done throughout all parts of this stack. Uh, so on the learning side, we're sort of trying to bridge um, some of the techniques that are used in, in sequence modeling like RNNs and, and some of the meta-learning ideas that we've been working on. Uh, so sort of unify these ideas. Um, in the, the uh, system modeling, we're, we're, as I said, working on some spatial modeling ideas. In the control side, um, what's most interesting to us right now is the propagation of uncertainty in the SEALs framework is basically open loop. So what I mean by that is that when it's propagating uncertainty, it's not characterizing how future information gain will be used to change control actions in the future, which is, this is kind of very related to, to dual control. Um, and that's because it's an extremely difficult problem. So what we're, we're, we're working on right now is how to add in basically recourse on parameter estimation that allows us to, uh, to improve our uncertainty propagation by incorporating the possible future information gain. And for that, we're using ideas from adaptive control, uh, which are based on basically uncertainty cancellation. So we're gonna specify a uh, suboptimal policy that will um, given some, some match subspace. So, so if your uncertainty is entering into in, through some uh, subspace, the same subspace as your control actions, basically, you can take the suboptimal step of trying to directly cancel out the effects of that uncertainty. Um, but we know how that will be reflective in the uncertainty propagation. So what we get as a result of that is much smaller uh, future reachable sets, because we know that we're going to sort of cancel out our uncertainty, uh, although our policy will be slightly suboptimal. So, so that's the main direction that we're going right now on some of this control stuff. Thank you very much. 
Any other question? What are the limits? Um, of all of it or yeah. <laughs> any particular part? Yeah. Oh. Um, well, we've assumed, um, we, we've assumed densities throughout, right? Which is always a dangerous game. I would say that like this, the developed framework is gonna be effective anytime you have thin tailed noise or light tailed noise. Um, when you start getting into heavier tailed noise, I have some ideas, but we haven't really built them out yet. Um, and, and I'm not sure how, how well these methods would work. Um, we have some tests on real world data, but you know, uh, we, we don't have any really robust system, like heavy tailed noise robotic demo still. Um, I would say the biggest gap that I haven't looked at so far, or sort of the people that I work closely with, none of us have, have had the confidence to, to attack yet, is uh, we haven't integrated um, sensing uncertainty uh, or sensor noise. Um, combining uh, dynamics learning and uh, state estimation is an extremely challenging problem um, that there are simple approaches around uh, you know, simple autoregressive model to pr predict observations, maybe, but I think is a, a challenging but hopefully fruitful uh, avenue of research for the future. Okay, thank you. I have maybe one question out of curiosity. That's a funny one. The framework you called PCOC is, that's not a random, right? I, I guess it has to do with the name of your advisor, right? <laughs> it's not random. Uh, I, uh, well, you may have noticed. Um, yeah, no, I noticed. <laughs> like, like, well, naming, naming algorithms has become a bit of a, a hobby. Uh, you know, in the tedium of, of coding them all up, sometimes you need a break and coming up with a algorithm name is a good one. And so Marco submitted a request that uh, Peacock be worked into the uh, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. into the list and it ended up working out. Very good, very, very cool one. Um, yeah, if there are no other questions, I'm sure people have noted down your email in case uh, they want to reach out for further questions. Yeah, feel free. I thank you very much for the talk. Great to see you again. Uh, good luck for your next uh, next steps and see you all yeah, next thanks, week. Sir. Great. Thanks, everyone. Thank you, James.